Hi, this is William Ramsey. The following is an interview I did on Hey GB Radio on August 14th of 2010, discussing my then recently published book, Prophet of Evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order. Again, this is an interview from seven years ago, and when I right after I published my first book. Thank you and enjoy. Good afternoon. This is GB with Hey GB Radio. We are broadcasting live today, and uh, we are doing a, uh, a pretty interesting show today. Um, we are having uh, William Ramsey on with us today, talking about his uh, book, Prophet of Evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order. Uh, so we're going to bring him on and uh, discuss some of the uh, aspects about the New World Order uh, in, in connection with Aleister Crowley, who we know is... Uh, fairly influential with uh, Masonic orders and <clears throat> and things like that. Um, we're going to start right off and get, get right into it. Um, I, I have to say I'm pretty pretty interested in hearing what uh, Mr. Ramsey has to say about his book, uh, going into a little bit of depth uh, about Crowley's past. Um, we're going to bring William on. William, are you with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. It, it was really interesting to uh, hear from you and and uh, read up on some of the uh, work you've done. Uh, so we're just going to kind of get after it. Yeah. Um, Great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I guess first off, uh, as far as uh, the New World Order is concerned, as far as uh, getting into uh, this connection with Aleister Crowley. Uh, I guess first off, if you want to start off, maybe letting us know what kind of led you into uh, exploring Crowley, and what got you interested in uh, this connection with the New World Order uh, to begin with. That's a good question. I uh, was very interested in 9/11. I uh, realized after a couple of years that the official explanation was a fraud, and so I researched and studied it as much as I could. I was really just reading everything I could on the internet. I got a lot of David Ray Griffin's books, and I kept seeing these numbers that were associated with the event. September 11th happened on the 11th. There was a flight 11. So I kept seeing these 11s and 93 and 77s. Uh, they kept popping up as I did my research, and there was uh, the event of 7-7 London bombing. And exactly. you know, I, I realized that a lot of these elites, uh, they believe in numerology or numerical significance associated with events. So I started researching and uh, I realized that these were occult numbers and they led me back to Crowley. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Uh, that was sort of, uh, with other people I've talked about uh, as far as, as New World Order, uh, this idea uh, concerns, I, it, uh, there's been a few people I've run into personally who have done uh, uh, research. Uh, we live in the information age, and uh, to, to get out there and do this research is now uh, uh, more possible uh, thanks to the internet and, and other and other means. Uh, a lot of people, uh, thank goodness, are, are kind of going down this road of exploring uh, the the truth and knowledge that's out there about uh, about world events, about the elites. Uh, we talked about the Bilderberg Group on our show here. We talked about uh, uh, the Club of Rome, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, these types of uh, uh, tops of the pyramid type organizations, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Uh, so uh, that's that's really interesting to to see uh, that road that you've gone down, and which ultimately led to this book, which. Uh, uh, I, I haven't read the entire book. I, I do intend on getting the entire thing. Um, I, I have read some excerpts and, and, and so forth. I have to say, uh, so from what I've seen so far, um, absolutely mind-blowing stuff. And uh, I'm uh, really interested in, in, in learning more and getting more out of, uh, out of what you've done here, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I guess um, starting off with, Crowley. Um, tell us a little bit about his childhood education uh, and, and some of the things that influenced him into, I think, what most people, when they hear the name of Aleister Crowley, uh, pretty much associate him with more of the satanic order, things like that. Uh, give, us a, give us a 
general discussion about uh, uh, his his upbringing. Okay, he was born in uh, Leamington Spa in England in 1875. He passed away in 1947, so he lived 72 years. He uh, was very well educated. He come from a uh, came from a wealthy brewing family that uh, made a much uh, lots of money in brewing. It was estimated by one researcher that it, his inheritance he inherited about 20 million dollars in our uh, in our terms. So he was very wealthy. He was tutored in Hebrew and and Latin and Greek. Uh, when he was growing up, he went to the best pub, uh, what they call public schools in England, but basically the best private schools in England. And uh, he was uh, raised by two parents who were affiliated with a very, um, what I would ter term, fundamentalist Christian faith, which was the exclusive brethren. Uh, he was only allowed to read the Bible up until the age of 12 when his father passed away. So he grew up in a um, very regimented Christian uh, household. He also went to these public schools or private schools in our parlance in England that were extremely brutal. They uh, uh, used to beat the kids. He explains a lot of his time there as uh, you know being punished. He had a six-month punishment once that almost killed him. Uh, it caused his kidneys to start to shut down. He had to be taken out of school. So he had had a uh, an upbringing that was very uh, rough. He called it a boyhood in hell was his uh, time at these uh, schools that he lived at. Uh, he explains one of his beatings that he got was 15 minutes of prayer, 15 strokes of the cane, 15 minutes of prayer, 15 more strokes and more prayer on top of it. So there's this, I think uh, he associated violence with a lot of these Christian, nominally, you know, nominally Christian schools. Yeah, um, yeah. So he, you know, he, uh, he exhibited elements of cruelty at a very early age. He uh, he talked about a time where he killed a cat just to see if it had nine lives, and he talks about it. He wrote, by the time he was 47, he wrote his Confessions, which was an autobiography. It was 800 pages long, and he uh, went in detail about his life, his his upbringing, etc. Although you know one can't take it um, as fully truthful, I think that he was being fairly honest. He probably didn't expect too many people to read it. Uh, as he was growing up, he was he was able to go to Cambridge, one of the top schools in England. Uh, with the elite, so he attended there at the Trinity College there with the same kind of luminaries such as Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, Charles, Charles Darwin. Uh, so he saw himself, and he really was part of the elite. He was an aristocrat. He was uh, a uh, very well-read person, and uh, he was influenced by Sir Richard Burton, who was kind of an adventurer. And it's important to also recognize that – I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, it was important to recognize that Crowley came of age in the late 19th century, just as England was uh, pretty much dominating the world. I mean, that was kind of their form of a new world order. The sun never never set on the English Empire. The, uh, you know, there was just openings in knowledge, transportation, and communications that, to somebody like Crowley, he was able to really become an adventurer, kind of like Sir Richard Burton. He was able to travel around the world twice uh, at a time when that was very unusual and uh, really kind of drink in a lot of uh, foreign ideas such as, you know, yoga from Hinduism and um, he was he was uh, commonly in Arabic countries. So this wasn't somebody who was like a hermetic hermetic figure who wrote books. He was also a literateur. He thought of himself as a poet. Back then he thought of himself as, I think he said, I was white hot on three things, poetry, climbing, and magic. He was a um, uh, an avid mountain climber. Uh, he did that for his health, but as he uh, it, aged, he became. It, I'm sorry. It's it's interesting to 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 see how uh, uh, how ultimately it, when you hear his name today and you go back and you, and you you do the research on on his uh, his upbringing, um, a very uh, self aware, very. Uh, um, uh, intriguing and and uh, somebody who's uh, motivated intrinsically to go out and find his own kind of way, his own his own knowledge. Um, I, I understand that his mother called him the Beast. That's correct. This, yes, he. This is pretty much where he got he, where he got this name, and, and I guess he was called that throughout his life. Pretty much, sure. That, yeah, he took it upon himself. He referred to himself as the Great Beast in all different types of languages. One of the terms he used was Tomega 
Asterion, which is the great beast. When he wrote his, there was another kind of biographical book he wrote called The Diary of a Drug Fiend, and the the lead character is, is basically him, and the name of that character is the Great Lion. So he associated himself with a lot of the darker elements of Revelations. You know, he said even of himself, he said he preferred the dragon, the false prophet, the beast, and the scarlet woman. And he called his consorts, uh, these women who would help him out in his late, later magical ris rituals, as scarlet women. So, yeah, the beast was what his mother did call him, and uh, he took it. He took it. He kind of interpreted it as it's very religious, uh, something associated with the Book of Revelation. And he really kind of yes. lived it. He was a, a, a huge blasphemer as he got older. Some of his writings or some I, – I couldn't even put him in the book. My book's a little rough with references to him because I tried to be as honest and truthful, but some of the blasphemies were so vicious that uh, I could not write him down in the book, even though I've, some people have read it and said, oh, this is too much. But that, uh, that, That's understandable. You know, I uh, doing the uh, uh, research I've, I've done uh, from your work, uh, I noticed even in the excerpts you put in there um, – with his uh, poetry and everything, like, and 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 everything as far as his writings uh, coming out of his experiences at, at these schools in England, uh, yeah, some of it is is just it's absolutely overwhelming. It's pretty harsh material uh, uh, for anybody out there who is uh, listening in. If you go if you go in and uh, you uh, and you get uh, William's book. Uh, it starts off pretty in depth and uh, gets gets right into uh, this character, uh, this this person, uh, uh, Alistair Crowley, and uh, the, from these these schools in England, um, I they were known, like you said, they were known for their for their harsh cruelty. Um, a lot of things, you know, when we look at uh, Ireland, England, uh, Scotland, and we look at uh, the Catholic Church influence there uh, in in the early part of the 1900s, uh, what was going on in these schools with with the abuse and things like that. Uh, Absolutely, you know, you wonder uh, how somebody would endure that and not have the attitude that Aleister Crowley came out with uh, and and lived on through his life uh, and and kind of turning his cheek towards these uh, uh, Christian uh, views and studies and uh, beliefs, um, it, you know, it, it almost takes somebody with strength to not turn the other cheek, but to uh, 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 get out there, do the research, and, and you know, uh, possibly go uh, into more of the Christian path, et cetera. Uh, but I got to tell you, this is Aleister Crowley is just one of the most intriguing figures uh, I think I've read upon. Um, as far as his as far as his magical practices, um, tell us a little bit about that. I uh, uh, understand he was uh, avid in uh, uh, ritual uh, ritual magic. Yes, for sure. He, uh, you know, when he was at Cambridge, he decided not to pursue. He was interested in chess. He didn't want to pursue that as a career. He was interested in climbing. That was There wasn't much of a career for that. Uh, he thought about public service in the political realm. He didn't want to do that. But what he did, because he was a man of wealth, uh, is dedicate his whole life to the occult. So right after he left Cambridge without obtaining a degree, he got involved in a magical society that some people are familiar with. It's called the Golden Dawn. Uh, the Golden Dawn was a late 19th century magical organization that had some other notable figures such as uh, W.B. Yeats, who was a you know, famous poet. Um, his most notable poem is uh, The Second Coming, which is you know, kind of a mytho-religious poem. It's very interesting. Anyway, so he got involved in the Golden Dawn, and that's really where he got most of his training. He uh, took on the, the kind of elements of what they taught, and the Golden Dawn back then was considered irregular masonry. It typically drew from the Masonic orders, so it was kind of like an advance on Masonry. Most of the three founders were all Masons. Uh, it was also influenced by the Ros Rosicrucian Society, so it was kind of a, a melting pot of all the occult knowledge uh, that was out there in the world back in the late 19th century. So 
that was a training ground for Crowley. He really advanced up through the grades uh, that were set out by the Golden Dawn and uh, spent all of his time engaging in magical ritual. And it was kind of an advanced advancement of rituals that were based on masonry and Rosicrucian grades. Uh, there was the, the primary figure in the Golden Dawn was a man by the name of McGregor Mathers. Mathers was somebody who, in my opinion, Crowley uh, emulated most of his life. Mathers never worked. He spent most of his time uncovering grimoires in the libraries of Paris and London. And uh, he took on kind of the magical, outer magical uh, views in, in the sense that he dressed like a magician. He carried around, a, you know, magical implements. He was constantly conducting rituals. So Crowley really drew a lot from him. Uh, he was a scholar and a gentleman by his opinion, and Yeats also was very influenced by him. There were two books that McGregor Mathers wrote. Uh, one was about the Kabbalah, and the other one was the Goetia, which is a uh, lesser key of Solomon, which are still prevalent in uh, magical practices today. And those are two that can be traced back to McGregor Mathers. So there's a heavy influence on the of the Kabbalah or Kabbalic uh, outlook. So uh, Crowley would, took all he could from the Golden Dawn, and um, he was largely involved in ruining the organization. It broke apart and then reformed under different names, but uh, he also learned a lot from masonry, became a 33rd degree mason, arguably. He also was uh, John Yarker, who was a uh, very important mason back then. I think it gave him the higher degrees of 90 and 95th degree of Memphis and Mizraim. He then started his own, after writing quite an in-depth amount of literature on the occult, he started his own magical order called the AA. It was Argentum Astrum, which means the Silver Star. And uh, he he basically created kind of a magical religion based on certain practices and disciplines. And in 1914, somebody from an uh, organization called the OTO, it was Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, visited Crowley and claimed that Crowley had stole their ideas. Uh, but in reality, what happened is Crowley and the this uh, German magical order came to the same conclusion, which was same conclusion or kind of discovery, I would say, which is the involvement of sexual practices in uh, rituals. So they both came to to find that uh, things could be enhanced with the rituals by the use of sex, and also Crowley uh, thought that it could be enhanced by the use of drugs as well. But uh, so the that's, Crowley that's was interesting uh, when we talked when when you mentioned the. Uh uh, the sexuality part of all of that. Uh, right off the bat, I think the first thing I thought of was uh, the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, uh, um, what other, uh, I, you know, we see influences of the occult throughout uh, popular culture in movies, TV shows. We even see these symbols used by the occult in advertisements uh, for uh, products, namely, uh, mostly in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, from what I've noticed, uh, I I tend to uh, not to uh, watch too much television, but when I do, I see these symbols pop up, and uh, I think to myself, wow, most people watching t television right now have no idea what they're looking at, especially when we see these uh, uh, these plots and these uh, settings in some of the in some of the films. Again, like Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, and and you can, I think you can go further on um, with that. Oh, there's tons of uh, references for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think the most notable of the symbols would be the all-seeing eye uh, is, is 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 prevalent, and we have it on the back of our dollar bill. Um, looking at uh, uh, the this this Masonic um, aspect. Uh, looking into, you know, first off, I'll, I will just say, listening to the story about Aleister Crowley and his upbringing um, reminds me a lot about uh, Adolf Hitler uh, and what he did. Uh, he had some wealth. He had some money. Uh, like Crowley, he was with a w uh, wealthy family. And you look at Adolf Hitler, uh, who uh, was – after his father died, he, he came into some money and spent his time kind of going down one avenue and then going down another and going down another and spent time in uh, these cities in Austria. Uh, he was a painter, did all this stuff, 
Uh, and it was uh, it was later on when, where he found his niche, and he just ran with it, uh, which we all know ended up being the, the Nazi party. Uh, and it seems like uh, Aleister Crowley uh, kind of followed this this similar path, interestingly enough, uh, kind of during the same time as 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 Adolf Adolf Hitler was was doing. Interestingly enough, um, yeah, and there know, there are talk. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Oh, I know that uh, Adolf Hitler was uh, involved in the occult. Uh, not to take anything away from Crowley at the moment, but uh, do you think that there is any influence uh, that Aleister Crowley may have played uh, into uh, Adolf Hitler uh, through possibly the Thule Society or the Theosophical Society? That's a good question. Uh, Crowley was very aware of the occult happenings all throughout the world. Uh, he was very well informed. He was very familiar with the esophical people. He was trying to always get in contact with them. Crowley was a type of person that people outside of the occult really would not really understand in the sense that he believed that you should just join every occult organization. Crowley was not strictly a Mason. He was a Mason, an OTO member, a member of the AA. He was arguably a member of uh, witches' covens, so he was not afraid to cover all bases. And there are connections between Crowley being in uh, Germany in the early 30s, and most of his writings. You know, he emphasized the primary word of his religion was the lima, which is Greek for will. And uh, Hitler also believed in in the power of the will. He there was a film by Lenny Riefenstahl called Tri Triumph of the Will. Triumph correct? of the Will. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so, and, you know, one of the aspects of people who knew Hitler said that he had an overbearing willpower, you know, other than other, you know, he had a good memory and he uh, was, you know, relatively well informed, but he said that he had willpower to overcome, and that was one of the things that, that Crowley emphasized was this uh, notion of the human will. So they were similar in that regard. They also uh, had a connection. Crow one of Crowley's early followers was a uh, person by the name of J.F.C. Fuller, he was, uh, he came up with the idea of massed tank attacks uh, as a breakthrough as far as military uh, procedures, and uh, it wasn't adopted by the British, they were more of a seafaring nation, but the Germans were heavily influenced by his ideas, and he was one of two Englishmen invited to Hitler's 50th birthday. So there's a direct correlation between Crowley to J.F.C. Fuller to Hitler right there, that a lot of historians and people wouldn't emphasize because they don't see Crowley as important, but they should because Crowley's ideas and Hitler's ideas were almost the same as far as his idea of an ideal state, about racism, and about, uh, you know, his, uh, his view of humanity. He was, he had a, you know, he, Crowley said that, uh, you know, we should have no compunction in utilizing the natural qualities of the bulk of mankind. We do not insist on trying to train sheep to hunt foxes or lecture on history. We will look after their physical well-being and enjoy their wool and mutton. In this way, we shall have a contented class of slaves who accept conditions of existence as they really are and enjoy life with the quiet wisdom of cattle. So he had a real slave mentality and a neo-Darwin. And, and Hitler basically ran a slave state. He had huge gulags where uh, if he didn't... Uh, send people, you know, it's kind of an awful story, but if he didn't send people to death, he was working them in hard labor camps, you know. So he had yeah. this whole notion of a slave mentality. And one of the common phrases that Crowley used was the slave shall serve. Uh, that was common in his, uh, one of his books. It was the intro to one of his books. When he, when he categorized and put together his uh, AA, his magical order, he took everything that he, written, he had written and categorized them by book. So he called them Lieber 1, Lieber 93, all these numbers that are important to him, but Lieber just means book. But in his book 77, and here you see the 77 again, the intro to book 77 says the slave shall serve. And he called that book 77 the rights of man. And it's basically the idea of human freedom, the loose, what I would consider the Luciferian idea of human freedom, which is, you know, yeah. do what you want it. And if anybody gets in your way, kill them. I mean, literally, Crowley said to kill them if they get in your way. And uh, that was one of Crowley's biggest dictums, or his primary phrase was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that's an 11-letter uh, phrase, I mean, an 11-word phrase with 11 syllables. So you see the 11 pop up again. But uh, so there yeah. it is, the will, you know, do what thou wilt. So that this whole notion, so 
where there may not have been, and there are people who have argued that Crowley um, was in contact with Hitler, but I couldn't find those historical uh, connections yet. And I, you know, I'm still, you know, I finished the book, but I'm still kind of trying to find little holes in my in my understanding. But uh, yeah, he said, I'm sure that he there's. Said, uh, I'm sure that there's. Uh, 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 I mean, could we expect a, a part two, possibly, to uh, your current book? It seems like there's uh, just a, there's so much out there. Yeah, I think that I'll probably do another edition in time. But I actually, the book I actually had a significant amount of other material that I was going to include that I took out, and that that material was really all the people who were influenced by Crowley, and it's a long list. So I just decided, you know, I'm going to do this and uh, try not to. Uh, you know, a lot of Crowley, Crowley biographers whitewash him. They don't talk about some of his darker elements. So I just wanted to do a, a kind of, uh, you know, finish my biography of him and make the connection to 9-11 and the New World Order fairly apparent and make that argument. And then uh, I just cut off all the other stuff. So my next book will be The Children of the Beast, which is all the people that have been influenced by Crowleyism, like Charles Manson, uh, Jack Parsons in California. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard and Timothy Leary, a lot of people don't know those connections. Robert Anton Wilson, Kinsey, who was the sexologist, uh, yep. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, Ozzy Osbourne, all these guys know Crowley. They just don't, you know, publicize or, or their, you know, their influence uh, by Crowley. So, and it's, it's important because that just shows how much Crowley's influence has suffused our 20th century culture, at least in the Western world. Exactly. Um, you mentioned... Uh you mentioned this Luciferian um, ideal. Uh, try and sum that up for us uh, about what this Luciferian at, at, at its base root is. Well, that's a good question. I think that uh, you know, it's. I think that in Crowley's cases, in Crowley's situation, he really thought that he was uh, he was a Luciferian. He believed in the devil, and he was a follower of the devil, and his views were. Uh, you know, this whole notion of a slave state, uh, he believed in the feudal, you know, feudal system was the ideal system. Uh, he believed in kind of destroying what he thought were tainted stock, like getting, you know, killing off the unfit, kind of just like Hitler. Uh, so as far as Luciferian, and, and you know, that's the interesting thing about Crowley. He wasn't just a, an occultist, but he believed in a political, you know, uh, application of his ideas. So, uh, as far as you know, his Luciferianism, it's all based on these societies. And a lot of these societies that they're some are blatantly Luciferian. But he said that at the AA, for example, the head of the AA is the devil. So that was his organization. Uh, the OTO has an outer head of the order, and you can imagine what the inner head of the order is. And then you know, at the higher levels of Freemasonry. That's when you really get into kind of the Luciferian tradition, as explained by Albert Pike. Yeah, you know, this uh, I've talked about uh, Freemasonry on the show many times, and uh, trying to get information out to people about what Freemasonry really is. And when you get down to the hardcore depth of studying it, um, it really leads you down a path that sometimes you feel yourself being drawn to because it's so interesting, but at the same time. Uh, you, you sometimes hear yourself kind of leaning back from it for a little bit or taking a break from it because it is so in-depth. It's stuff that is just, uh, it's not mainstream. It is it is a cult, a cult, you know, meaning, you know, things that are hidden. Um, the whole idea of, of this Luciferianism, uh, I ran across a video of uh, Bill Cooper, uh, who was a gentleman that we all know was involved with uh, – a radio show for many years uh, exploring this idea of the New World Order, trying to alert people to the fact of a, uh, a police state coming in, especially to the United States, but throughout the world. And uh, his, his, uh, uh, his summary of what this Luciferian idea is, is, as related to uh, the Freemasonic Order uh, was absolutely mind-blowing. And uh, he mentions it getting back to uh, the Garden of Eden, where, you know, growing up in a Christian household, we are taught and uh, and believe that um, in the Garden of Eden you have Adam and Eve uh, who were put there 
uh, by God, made by God in the garden. They were given the garden, and they were tenders of the garden, and they were free and blameless. And um, uh, uh, people who had never ever dreamt of uh, feeling pain or suffering, and they were kept in the garden uh, by God, and God told them one thing, not to eat from the tree of knowledge. And uh, from the Freemasonic order, from what Bill Cooper kind of sums up, is that the Luciferian idea is that um, Adam and Eve were held prisoner by an unjust God in the Garden of Eden, and as Eve went to the tree of knowledge and was uh, – uh, met by the, the the snake or the the reptile uh, there, uh, the uh, snake or Satan as we know uh, coaxed her into eating from the tree, telling her that uh, ye surely will not die. Uh, and he goes into the fact that uh, Bill Cooper goes into the fact that uh, Eve is 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 told that uh, God doesn't want you to eat from that tree because uh, it will give you knowledge, uh, the knowledge that he has, and uh, tells Eve that, you know, with this knowledge, you will be free from being imprisoned in the garden. And uh, yeah, that, that's, an in, no, that's an interesting idea because that kind of uh, emulates exactly what Crowley thought about his concept of freedom and liberty was – you know, freedom from restriction, so freedom to be not free from kind of moral constraints. So it's kind of similar to that kind of view of, you know, the Garden and Eden story, Garden of Eden story. Yeah, uh, it, it just just amazing insight from from Bill Cooper with with some of that idea, uh, these ideas. Bill Cooper's a, a totally different topic, different different show, but uh, I've mentioned it He's a couple very of times. Interesting. That, like, he, uh, you know, he what he achieved without the internet was for me uh, astonishing. I really uh, absolutely thought it was incredible. And also, uh, he had that whole idea of mystery Babylon, like it's all connected. And the way Crowley kind of operated in the occult is it all really was connected. Some people may perceive these institutions as independent of each other, but a lot of time, if somebody's involved in one accord occult as an organization, they're typically involved in a lot of others. So. Exactly. Um, so, uh, it, and it's it's uh, it's interesting also to note um, when we talk about Crowley, we talk about Freemasonry, we talk about this Luciferian idea. Excuse me. Um, uh, the term that it, it has kind of uh, come under, uh, which is humanism. This idea of humanism that we see in the Humanist Manifesto, uh, one and two, uh, and the influence that it's going into uh, the United Nations. Uh, some research we've done on the United Nations is that they are, uh, you know, some of the people there are heavily influenced by this idea of humanism, uh, which I think, uh, I mean, would you agree the humanism is, kind of reflects from that Crowleyism, like you said? Well, I think that they are, there's that same strain of, like, the man is God. Crowley thought that, uh, like, going back to Book 77, another intro to Book 77 is that man is God or God is man. So in the, in the you know, general humanism, uh, maybe not, but in a specific type of kind of human first or were first principle, Crowley definitely thought that man was it. So they didn't, you know, they, it's a kind of rejection of the Almighty, in my opinion, and, uh, he, uh, I think he had exemplified that. He he called like uh, the devil the the angel who made gods of men. So you see this kind of similar theme of uh, you know this this kind of that form of humanism. I I I, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's it's just it's it's interesting to see the shape of our. Uh, world culture or U.S. culture today uh, being in being sl slowly ingrained with this idea of this humanism uh, uh, and uh, not even knowing it, uh, it it's it's sometimes overwhelming and it's it it sometimes answer 
answers questions about why things are uh, in, in mainstream uh, media and, and, and all this. You know, man uh, uh, can save himself is the idea. And uh, we find this in the uh, uh, these global warming efforts uh, and, and, and what have you. Uh, as far as the global warming thing is concerned, uh, uh, I know the, uh, the idea of this Gaia religion, uh, I call it a religion, it, that's debatable, but I personally call it a religion, uh, which is uh, Mother Nature, and uh, that uh, uh, man worships the creation and not the creator, and that right. uh, Mother, Mother Earth is, is uh, going to save us and all this all this stuff. Uh, it's absolutely uh, unbelievable, and uh, pretty much the reason why uh, we do this show is to kind of open people's eyes to the fact that, you know, man cannot save himself. And, you know, with the global warming thing, um, it's almost it, it's almost uh, an, this strange thought pattern going around the world with the elites and these people going to, like, the conferences that they had in Copenhagen last December. Um, we try to control the earth uh you know if this thing is cyclical uh, over uh thousands of years earth has cycles goes through geological cycles and and the fact that we think that we can actually stop the earth from going through a uh a cyclical pattern i mean that is uh that goes right into pride uh and into and we in pride leads itself into this humanist idea and humanist leads its ideas into this Luciferian idea. Um, uh, it's just Agreed. amazing, these, these connections. Absolutely. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. I totally um, agree with you. The humanism, humanism also is like the communist view, which is, you know, we can do it without God. And Yeah, you're absolutely right. The humanism, is the, the next step right there is to like, okay, we can make our own decisions. Man is God. There's no God but man. And these, yeah. what I would consider blasphemous statements and, and, and basing their lives upon those statements as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, you know, we always tell people, if you're listening in, uh, we always tell people to uh, do your own research. Uh, we live in the information age, and uh, uh, the this information is out there. Uh, you know, I always tell people, kill their television and, uh, you know, get online, do some research, educate yourself about the things going on in the world. Uh, we live in some extraordinary times right now politically, and uh, spiritually, and uh, um, uh, becoming knowledgeable about the world around you that is hidden, uh, I think is, uh, or shall I say hidden from the mainstream, uh, is one of those ways where uh, you will ultimately find truth in this uh, seemingly wicked world. Um, your book, uh, The Idea of September 11th, uh, you mentioned numerology and things of that nature. Um, give us like a brief timeline, uh, if, if if you can, sum up like a brief timeline of possibly uh, this uh, Crowley influence into that day of September 11th. Well, that's a good question. So Crowley, you know, his he basically created a religion. It was a Luciferian religion. Uh, he emphasized certain numbers. He used the Kabbalah. And his two main words in his uh, his kind of uh, approach were thelema and agave. Those are both Greek words, but in the Kabbalah they both equal 93. And uh, he was he was uh, he was interested in contacting entities. One of the main entities that he contacted was by the name of Awas, and it translated to him the Book of the Law. And the trans in Hebrew, uh, the, under Hebrew Kabbalah, Awas equals 93 again. So. Under his system, the 93s pop up quite frequently. Then you have his 77, which uh, Libra Oz, or seven, 77 equates to OZ, which is a whole different, you know, occult uh, connection. But uh, he had his book 77, which was the rights of man. He also, 77 are the 77 names of the devil in Anton Sandor LaVey's uh, The Satanic Bible. So those two numbers are very important. And then 11... Are, is like the conjunction of the hexagram and the pentagram. That those two together equal 11. 11 is the number of perdition. Uh, that even goes back to the traditions uh, involved in the Golden Dawn, and it's also the 11 letters of his. You know, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. 
And uh, so 11s always pop up. Well, I recognize that all four plane flight numbers on the date of September 11th were 11, 77, 93, and 175. And 175 in Crowley's uh, system that he created in the AA, 175 is uh, how you do a ritual to adhere yourself to a god by adoration. So you choose your god and then you do the ritual to kind of adhere yourself to his principles. So that's that uh, sounds that's like the idea what... in Islam uh, with death. You you know in Islam the belief of dying and uh, going on to meet uh, all the uh, virgins, basically. Yeah, so it's uh, so those numbers suffused the events, and that that event you know changed our world. It was like a push forward for what could be called the new world order, a new state, uh, a state of global warfare. Uh, we lost a lot of our rights through what was called the Patriot Act, which was not patriotic at all. Uh, we had elections that were stolen. Uh, we had a large, large amount of these bombings that took place. We had this fake terror, well, the war on terror, which is some kind of weird mind control. Uh, you know, new uh, 1984 uh, George Orwell assault through our mass media. So we have a controlled mass media as well. So uh, for me, 9/11 was a crucial event of our lives. You know, I I write about it. I reference Shakespeare in my book. I said, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. Like, that's the way I viewed uh, 9-11. And it's just a complete mind control to actually assume that 19, 19 terrorists somehow hijacked the most sophisticated defense system in, in the world's history and somehow pulled that off. So uh, for me, 9-11 is a complete magic trick. It's a fraud. And it also has occult uh, connections. Yeah, I mean, that ultimately, from what you've summed up so far about this numerology uh, coming out of Crowley, um, it's almost, you know, it's, 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 how could it be a coincidence that the flight numbers all match up to these occult symbols and these, this occult numerology? How could it be a coincidence? And I, I think just that's don't the know. We need to ask, you know. I agree. I mean, I've tried to, like, I'm an ar as an armchair statistician, if you took, like, a, a, a pool of 175 numbers and then ascribed the top four, to, like, the most important as they were in Crowley's system, and then, you know, what's the chance of those four happening on that date out of 175? And just a simple equation there, it's infinitesimal, the likelihood of those four important numbers showing up right then, you know. So, you know, our uh, in my opinion, statistics is more art than science, but still, it's uh, it's very unlikely. Yeah, and and I I know uh, many people have questions about 9/11, uh, questions in in how the buildings fell. Uh, building seven pops up all the time. Uh, British news, uh, from what I've done, aired the uh, uh, news about the buildings falling about 20 minutes before they even fell. Uh, and, and there's just all these little tiny nuances on that day that when you get down to the root of it and, and, and you look at it, it, they don't add up like you would imagine that they should. So I think it's in human nature to ask questions and um, uh, kind of put these connections together. And it, it, it I, I think it's something that uh, the mainstream media has really messed up on uh, with with silencing uh, these questions. Uh, it, it, we should be allowed to to question our our, our, our government in, in any matters. Uh, I mean, that's just what our what the United States is about is, is about questioning and about uh, getting into uh, the topics that the people want to talk about and and explore and the the whole 9-11 Commission uh, book and, and report and all that, uh, I mean, it, it, you, it's almost like a lost read, really. Uh, and they don't, they don't really uh, uh, reveal uh, much detail into these questions that we have and uh, leading into um, uh, this influence by numerology and these occult masters like uh, Alistair Crowley. 
Um, I agree. I mean, I, I think that the mass media isn't really there to inform. It's to misinform, and it serves uh, the interests of a largely oligarchical society. You know, they back up the mass, the large corporations and uh, the political elite. So for me, they're, it's a totally corrupt and vile uh, media system right now as far as information goes. Yeah, and I, I think uh, – I forget who it was, but uh... – they, uh, uh, it was a uh, a talk show radio host, um, mainstream, surprisingly, uh, uh, refers to uh, the mainstream media, not as the mainstream media, but as the propaganda matrix or the propaganda machine, which if you watch enough television, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get fed information. It's just like going to university. It's just like going to college. It's just like going to work if you work in a uh, uh, corporation around the world. Interestingly enough, these uh, the corporations around the world, uh, it's amazing to see how structured uh, they have become when it comes to uh, this whole idea of a new, this new world order uh, with its uh, top-down pyramid shape. Um, and uh, uh, I think David Icke puts it best. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with David Icke's work, but uh, I think he puts it best when he says uh, we are taught to believe that the the power of the pyramid is at the top uh, when it's not. We're we the ones at the lower are the ones holding it up, uh, right. holding that top of the pyramid up. And uh, uh, David Icke has done a, a great job of getting uh, some of this information out there and waking people up to uh, to the reality of the structure of power in the world. And uh, I, it 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 kind of just blows me away when when we when uh, I talk about the the structure of power in the world on the show, and I talk with people in, in public and uh, family friends, and how could you not believe that there's a a larger power structure in the world when every day you go into work and there's a CEO of the company next down from him is the the VP and next down from him is the uh, so forth and so forth, and you go right down the pyramid, and how we would not be able to recognize that larger structure in a global uh, kind of quote unquote corporation uh, is is uh, is nearsighted, I think. And uh, uh, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's absolutely mind blowing. Uh, some of this stuff, um, the new world order. Uh, we hear this term. Uh, I know it has other terms such as the uh, uh, kind of the uh, new order of the ages, uh, which we get from Freemasonry. Um, in your book, do you get into uh, the political aspects of this new world order, maybe stemming out of the League of Nations, et cetera, after World War II? Not much. I just kind of emphasized what Crowley was was up to and how he influenced the ideas of uh, what I consider the New World Order, the notion of a slave state, a feudal system, which I think we're going into. And, you know, other people like John Coleman have, have uh, emulated that same, like in his book, The Committee of 300, he recognizes a feudal system. So you see these correlations. Uh, you also see correlations between uh, Crowley and uh, people like Aldous Huxley, and who's Aldous Huxley's brother was Julian Huxley, the head of UNESCO. So uh, Crowley actually painted uh, Aldous Huxley's portrait, and Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Do What You Will, which is very similar to Crowley's dictum. So you see that his ideas or his connections uh, are there with people who, uh, you know, for me, Brave New World was almost like a prophetic book, not just like 1984, but there was also that kind of lack of warning, like 1984 was something, I mean, Brave New World was something like an ideal state. And you, we remember Aldous Huxley's speech to Berkeley where he talked about, you know, doping the public and making people love their servitude. And I think that uh, you can see people loving their servitude in an uh, American state where people, you know, one-fifth of the population is on antidepressants or hooked on yeah. drugs. And uh, you see constant lies put out by the mass media, lies about the war, lies about the food you eat, lies about the financial system that you're involved in. 
And so uh, I just see like Crowley as an influence. I don't see him as an architect, but more of like an inspiration. And you have to have that evil will to do that to your fellow man. So for me, he had that. He believed in an aristocratic two-tiered society. And that's kind of what you see today is a, uh, you know, the top, the people at the top are getting richer while the poor are just being thrust down into degradation and enslavement. He said, uh, there's only one solution to pick out the diamonds from the clay, cut them, polish them, and set them as they deserve. A, t a deserved attempt to no idiotic experiments with the muck of the mind, that's like the average person. He will observe that I'm advocating an aristocratic revolution, and so I am. And you can kind of even see the, you know, the New World Order, I think uh, the guy who wrote the book on uh, the Bilderberg Society, he said, the, uh, Daniel Estelin was his name, but he said, the New World Order is the Old World Order, and that's really the truth. A lot of the New World Order formulations are from old line families in the United States and uh, Europe, you know, pulling the strings on corporations and media and really dominating uh, everything we've seen, at least in the last 10 years and, and more than that. And, it moves against at least our, what I thought were our ideas as Americans, which is egalitarianism, uh, meritocracy, dispersion of power. Uh, you know, we, the, the formulation of this country was based on state federal uh, bifurcation, three tripartite part of government. So the guys who for, the, the founding fathers who formulated our country were aware of you don't want to have too much centralized power in anything and you want to have different parts of the governments fighting against each other. Well, we see that move against that torpo type of, uh, you know, uh, tripartite government into, you know, what was called uh, the imperial presidency, or I forgot what Cheney talked about it as. But So I see yeah. that kind of desire for a feudal state, a top-down, the slave shall serve, aristocratic. Uh, and Curley was an unabashed aristocrat. He really had no idea or no concept of actually having a real job. He had always relied upon his inheritance, and when he ran out on that, he basically was a parasite towards his followers, and they had to send him money for him to survive. So he really had no 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 co correlation to anybody middle class or working class. And uh, so I see that as uh, an influence on our present kind of political environment in a global sense. Absolutely. Crowley as the whisper in the ear of the elites directing and guiding policy, uh, global policy and state policy over the past decades and uh, uh, absolutely influencing this, this idea of this new world order. Um, and on past shows, I've just kind of reiterated to people about uh, the year 1989, which is, to me personally, one of the most interesting years uh, in my lifetime, uh, and, you know, we are taught that 1989 was the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the end of communism, where really it was a beginning. It was uh, a beginning of this new world order, and George Bush Sr. outlines that in his uh, speech to the nation, uh, and uh, from there for, uh, from going forward from there, uh, we see uh, UN developments into Agenda 21, which is nothing but a, uh, a seemingly a New World Order constitution outlined uh, in sustainable growth and sustainable uh, ideas as far as uh, uh, nature is concerned. So this, there's this, uh, this nature input, and uh, it's interesting about nature, how you can get into some of this uh, magic that Crowley was involved in. And uh, uh, leading up through what we have today, which uh, which you've been talking about with uh, these 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 influences in today's culture, um, uh, and and uh, the the public policies that are going on now, definitely 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 influenced by uh, Aleister Crowley and his ideas on uh, will, and like you said at the beginning of the show, uh, this idea of the will and uh, do what thou wilt, uh, this, this idea of being free from constraints. But funny enough, uh, free from constraints, uh, but having the, uh, the, the, the top of the pyramid elites uh, outlining uh, how we feel about our current constraints, 
uh, trickling down into everyday life uh, with how we perceive going to work, getting our getting our uh, uh, stuff done for the day, and going down the list of uh, our routinized existence, uh, which kind of ultimately leaves us blind and in the dark uh, unless you go out and you do the research like you've done uh, for your book and uh, uh, the research we do here. So uh, It's really true. I mean, we're in a different form of kind of upgraded enslavement in a lot of ways. You have to keep running to make – uh, more phony Federal Reserve notes to pay your debts. Uh, but people don't have time to really learn that the uh, public school system is a, a wretched joke in a lot of ways. They're not really addressing uh, modern uh, problems with our lives. They're, it's a 19th century model, and it's training people to get up, stand up, sit down, or buy a bell. So it's like this weird Pavlovian uh, yeah. ritual yeah. that we, we take for granted. I mean, it's like, oh, this is normal. Well, it's not normal to me. I, I think it's fully abnormal. And uh, it's it's led people not to, you know, the, the first thing that people should be taught when they're 14 or 15 is critical functioning, critical uh, reasoning, and rhetoric, because if they did, so much of this edifice that's been built up would crumble to dust when people would just analyze it and realize, hold on, hold on, these people aren't even, they're all lying to us. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at the hardcore existence of, of, of an educational system, uh, you know, education, yeah, you know, I think there should be some education. And like you said, yeah. uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the things going on in school now are just, uh, you know, I, the most education I ever got uh, was outside of school doing my own research uh, into the, these things, such as the New World Order and, and other other facets of uh, uh, global politics, which, you know, I always tell people everything that you know about global politics is a lie. Uh, Agreed. And, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just mind-blowing uh, to think about uh, the way we are headed um, <clears throat> and uh, – the, the, the policies and, and things going on, especially in the United States and, uh, and even the European Union, which we know uh, uh, um, some of the states in the European Union are heavily uh, uh, bogged down by this idea of Big Brother, et cetera, uh, and uh, uh, awakening you know, the, the uh, people is, is uh, I think, necessary to, to uh, kind of start over. Yeah, I mean, we're headed to or to an environment where you're going to have cradle to grave surveillance, and your whole life will be, if it's not already happening right now in some secret, you know, vault in the United States. But you're going to have everything put into some computer where people are going to make decisions for you, like it was, you know, communist Russia or something. It's it's pretty scary where we're headed, and we're slipping down that farther and farther down that slide to. You know, a really dark place if people don't wake up and uh, say no. You know, exactly. So. Um, William, we only have about a minute left in the show. Um, again, uh, William Ramsey here with us today on HGB Radio, uh, uh, discussing his uh, book, Prophet of Evil: Aleister Crowley, 9/11, and the New World Order. Uh, William, where can people go to uh, purchase uh, your book? You can find it on Kindle, or you can also go to my website. It's www.occult911.com. And I can send you a PDF copy, or you can buy a kind of softbound covered copy as well if you're interested. And uh, I will say that I do intend on uh, purchasing a copy of of your of your book, which is uh, from from the little bit of that I've read so far is absolutely. Uh, again, I always hear, use the term mind blowing because that's the best term that I can uh, conjure up uh, to describe it. But it really is, and. Uh, William, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, this has uh, been one of the uh, most interesting shows uh, that uh, we have definitely had here at HGB Radio uh, uh, via blogtalkradio.com. And uh, uh, we, uh, any, to anybody listening, uh, thanks for tuning in. Again, you can uh, purchase William's book uh, at occult911.com. And uh, this is, this is going to wrap up the show for today. Uh, again, William, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, that will conclude today's show. Uh, you can go back and uh, listen to this. It will be archived. This is GB signing off from HGB hey Radio. Stay tuned, stay informed, and stay out of the dark.
Still there? Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, that oh, sure. was, uh, that was absolutely, uh, I mean, your rundown in the, uh, in the aspects of your book are, uh, uh amazing. I, I look forward to reading it and, uh, uh possibly getting out there and, and, and doing some more, uh, inf- uh, study on this, uh, the Golden Dawn, which is, uh, that's fairly new to me. So, uh, it'll be interesting to, to, uh, read up on your, uh, research in your book. Um, Good, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more there. You know, there's uh, like all the stuff, people that you ran into, Aldous Huxley, Hemingway, Somerset Mom, H.L. Mencken. Uh, you know, there's all their parts of his story, like uh, the Abbey of Thelema, where he basically started a church that was similar to the Hellfire Clubs of uh, the late 18th century. Uh, he was a spy for the English in uh, World War One in the United States. He actually took the Lusitania to the United States in 1914, and that was the boat that sunk that set off World War I uh, for the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so he he was there. I mean, this was not somebody who was uh, outside of society. He was actually right in the thick of things. And in my book, I have tons of, well, a large repository of uh, pieces and new, uh, newspapers of the time you know, talking about Crowley, calling him the servant of the devil, you know. They were familiar with yeah. Crowley. This is, this is a, you know, it gets really interesting then. And so then you see his influence. He's a aristocrat. He didn't, you know, he had contempt for the masses. And it's a, just a straight reflection of, like, uh, our political outlook today where they could care less if you live or die, you know what I mean? There's just absolute no uh, empathy for, you know, other people by a lot of our elites. So uh, you see Crowley's ideas, if not direct connection suffusing everything in our culture today. And if you had asked me anything about Crowley, yeah, if you had asked me anything about Crowley two or three years ago, I wouldn't have known diddly squat, you know. But once I started, I read all of his biographies. Then I read people of that time who referenced Crowley or knew of him. And uh, then I read a lot of his stuff. I read his autobiography. And I was like, well, I, I better just write this down and put it into a book. So my book has like 500 footnotes. I over footnoted it just because I didn't think people would believe, uh, one, I don't think they would believe what I was saying was a true narrative, and two, yeah. it'll operate as a research basis or guide for people who want to go in greater detail about Crowley, but uh, yeah, it's all there. I don't, you know, I think it's, uh, it could have been longer. I tried to keep it at 200 pages because I don't think people have the time or the inclination to read a huge novel. I could have wrote 600, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's actually yeah. a little harder to keep it shorter. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to read it. I, this is this is some interesting stuff. Interesting stuff, and, and I, I, uh, I, I'm kind of the same. You know, a few years ago, uh, oh, I, maybe four years ago, if somebody asked me about the New World Order, if they asked me about the uh, Freemasons or what have you, I, I, I would have had no clue how to respond. Uh, but then, you know. I uh, ran, you know, you get on the internet, you do a little uh, clicking around, and I, I've always been interested in politics and uh, did some political science studies uh, at university. So uh, this this is kind of just what I do. I'm just, you know, intrigued and, and I, uh, I I research and do all this stuff. Uh, and I happened to come across some things that uh, I saw the words New World Order. And from there on, it just uh, just was a snowball effect for me. And it's just one thing led to another. And then you, when you put it out on a piece of paper, you, you draw it out or, or script it out, all of these things connect. And it's, it's, it's unreal. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. unreal. And then uh, getting into the spiritual aspect of that, uh, of the, this idea of the New World Order and this Freemasonic uh, thing going on, um, uh, wow. And, you know, I, I, I talk to people as much as I can uh, about, about the, you know, when I see, like, a, a new uh, policy coming out of Washington, you know, I automatically go into it and research it and look at it. And, and man, some of these... Uh, some of these policies coming out of there are just so directly connected with this new world new world order idea. Um, the Georgia Guidestones, I, I, which you are you familiar with those at all? Probably. Very much, uh, yeah. Huh? 
Yeah, yeah. That's uh, this whole idea of population control, eugenics. I mean, my God, it's it's you know for a while doing the research, it became so overwhelming at one point that you know I took I took kind of a hiatus from my research, uh, but then ultimately came back to it. And uh, I, you know, there's a period where you need to like let this stuff sink in. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I can yeah. tell you, researching Crowley for me was it wasn't uh, a cakewalk. I didn't enjoy it. I I felt I had to re, uh, write the book and kind of get the information out there out of conscience. But you know, it wasn't something I uh, enjoyed. I was the same way, man. There were certain parts there I was like, man, I can't take much more of this. This is this is so dark, man. You know, this is uh, yeah, it is. So it is dark. I, it really is. I was stressed out and you know all kinds of psychosomatic problems. So it's like. You know, it's not it's not something I'm, I'm. You know, it's not pleasant, but also I just want people to be informed that it's not. You know, the New World Order isn't just a political uh, structure; it's a spiritual as well. There's some very wicked people who have wicked designs, and uh, yeah, awareness and expanding people's awareness about it helps inoculate them against some of the BS out there. You know, because there is a yeah. lot of that. So yeah, it is, and and try to filter through it as much as possible. Try to stay away from the uh all those uh political talk shows as much as possible. It's good to like go on there and just uh kind of see what is being broadcast out just so you can, you know, get some sort of frame to work around through the research that you do to when you are talking with people. Uh, uh -huh. getting around that that mainstream idea and pushing people to say, "Hey, you know, this is just nothing but propaganda uh it's just it's unbelievable i'm real yeah it's pretty sad and you know there's a lot of people who sold us out sold out the country and uh it's it's too bad that we were in this position you know it's i think uh some ways we've been put to sleep so that they could pull it off you know what i mean that's kind of the feeling i've been i got is like first exactly. they put you to sleep and distract distract you and then they take even more of your you know more of what you've got yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling that way too, which is good. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it continues and people people start to wake up and and more and more people wake up to the reality of what the heck's going on. Yeah, uh, and I think yeah, that that's be, really it. People are in a process. There's kind of a great awakening taking place in this country now that uh, you know people are. They're not as uh, atomized, you know. They can talk over the internet. They exchange things around the mass media, where it's kind of like almost an underground, like in uh, Soviet Russia, where people would, you know, there was the Pravda, which was truth, which was absolute total lies, and then there was kind of the secret underground where people would really exchange the real truth, you know. Exactly. That's that's exactly what it reminds me of. Uh, in in itself, it becomes this. Uh, kind of esoteric uh, underground uh, highway of knowledge of uh, and the truth of what, what is going on with, with, you know, all these public policies and all this stuff coming out of Washington and, and the UN and the G20 and the Bilderberg group okay. and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's absolutely a good uh, analogy uh, with what's going on. So Yeah. Pretty, pretty scary. Uh, you can hear some of my other talks I've done. Uh, I don't know if you, li you listen to Visigoth. Do you know what Visigoth is? Um, I don't. I, I caught your L.A. talk radio uh, okay. show. That was really good. That was uh, okay. that was really, really good. Um, caught that. I, I, I told some people about that. I think they went in and, and had a listen. So uh, I, I I think we're, you know, getting the word out about your book is, is kind of underway. When did you kind of finalize the the, the book itself not very long ago maybe a month so I just oh, wow. finished it and then well, yeah, what I did is I sent out a bunch of emails I kind of made a ham handed approach of trying to see uh, who would be interested I just sent out people who were interested in the New World Order or 9-11 and I started going on shows I was on uh, uh, Oracle Radio I'm on uh, one guy's name is Rob Chowda Another is uh, okay. Charlie Giuliani. Do you know who Charlie Giuliani is? Uh, sounds familiar. Well, it's on like Oracle Broadcasting, so you can hear some of my shows from there. 
I did a two-hour show with a guy named Visigoth. I just finished another one, two hours, for uh, Future Quake. Have you heard of Future Quake? Future Quake, no. No, I'll have to check it's that out. It's more of like a Christian... It's more of like a Christian type uh, theme show, but I, you know, I'm a Christian, so it was a good fit. Okay. They had a whole different, whole different. You can listen to it if you're interested. It's Future Quake, and they uh, they do a lot of New World Order stuff, but they had a whole different approach. They really focused on Crowley's early life and you know what, yeah. uh, how that kind of influenced his rejection of uh, Christian moral code or whatever. So yeah. the, that guy, that guy read the whole book, so he was very. Uh, <clears throat> you know, well apprised of, like, he hit me with some pretty tough questions. And uh, let's see, I'm doing, I got some other shows. I'm doing another one on Wednesday, Knuckle Bones wow. tonight, 11 to 1, which I don't even know if I can stay up that late. But, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've been kind of getting out there. If you want to hear some of the other stuff, if you have any other questions or you want to do another show in a month or two, I'd be up for that. Oh, that sounds like an absolutely awesome idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay in touch with you, and you do the same. Uh, and, okay. yeah, we'll definitely uh, – would love to keep getting the word out about your book. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about this stuff every show. So uh, I think this is just fitting in really great with, with, with what we've been doing over the past year uh, with this Blog Talk great. show. So, um, Well, you know, if you read yeah. the book and have any other questions or want to do take a different tack, I'm up for that, you know, whatever – there's a lot more to go over, just, uh, you know, his spying, his Davy of Thelema, more of his magical stuff, the OTO, all that yeah. other information. So. Yeah, yeah, I wish I, wish I had more time to, to kind of uh, spread it out further today. But uh, I, think what, I think what we got today uh, is a good kind of overview and a beginning. And I think maybe yeah. if, we come, if, if you come back on next show, we can, we can re- like you said, we can knuckle down and really get into uh, some of these other aspects of uh, what influenced uh, Crowley and uh, uh, we can also go Andy. over like the yeah we can also go over the people he influenced just like Kenneth Grant Hubbard Leary like here here's Leary he says you're a god act like one he also uh, wow. did all the same stuff Crowley did he entered the pyramid of chaos in Egypt which Crowley did he uh, went to Algeria just like Crowley did and did rituals he carried Crowley's uh, tarot deck around with him all the time. And uh, he just almost copied so much. He started at an abbey like Crowley in uh, Zihuatanejo in Mexico. Oh, wow. So he almost followed. A lot of people don't rec- realize. I didn't know it either, but a lot of people don't recognize how much. And that guy had a massive influence upon our culture as Americans, at least, you know, from the 60s, yeah. et cetera. So. Yeah, and I, I've just uh, recently come across, like, this, this uh, interest in the Rosicrucian order um, and the Sir Francis Bacon and, and and some of that stuff. So if you have anything on that, we could definitely go in, well, into Crowley, – Well, Crowley actually – yeah, Crowley uh, visited the guy who started Amork, which is the ancient mysterious order of the Rosy Cross in San Jose, California, and uh, – he said that he was using magic to make money, and he apparently made a lot of money. And I've been to the uh, Amor Center. They have an Egypt, Egyptian museum there, and they've got all the obelisks. They have a Sir Francis Bacon library. So it's and they have books for sale by, uh, what's it, the Secret of, all, Secret of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. So they oh, have yeah. all the yes. old. Where, what part of the country are you in? Uh, northeast. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, that's a big part of San Jose. You know, they ship kids over there all the time to walk them through the Egyptian museum. They have no idea they're being like subtly inducted into you know the the Rose Cross mysterious yeah. border. So it's pretty wild. Wow, that that would be really interesting to check out. Yeah, and you can read uh, about it in my book. There's a little blurb I have on the guy's name. I wish I could remember his name, but. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Ancient Mysterious Order of the Rose Cross, AMORC, is their acronym. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm kind of jotting all this stuff down so I can uh, uh, yeah, kind of get up to speed. Wow. Um, yeah, so, uh, like I said, I'd love to have you back on and uh, get into some more of this stuff. Maybe we could even stretch it out uh, if, if I have time. Uh, maybe we could do, uh, you know, if you, if you gave enough material to do like a two-hour 
or at Absolutely. least like an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, that, sure. that'd be great. So uh, I'll, I'll keep in touch with you. And, and we'll, great. You've got we'll my email address and everything, so. Yep, yep. You know? 